Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Kickleball Podcast. I'll be your host, Colin Freeman, for this episode. In this episode, I sat down with Portland men's soccer head coach Nick Carlin Voigt and discussed everything Portland men's soccer as well as his personal career. This was a fantastic conversation with Nick. We talked about changes within the game that needs to take place, how he's transformed Portland as a program, as well as how much he's learned from his playing days, as well as his stops over his coaching career, and how key figures throughout his coaching career have influenced his time so far at Portland and will continue to influence for years to come. This is one of my favorite conversations I had with the coach. There was a lot of talk about changes that need to take place in the game, something I'm really passionate about, as well as Coach Boyk. So really hope you enjoy this conversation. And with that, let's get to the interview. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll get into it. I mean, obviously, I know the spring season is kind of coming to an end here. So if you could just begin off by kind of talking about the spring season for you guys. And, you know, I know you guys had experiences against a couple of pro clubs, but what was that experience for, you know, the program this spring? Yeah, it's it's always great. I think a, a good carrot for the spring is is to test yourself against professional teams. So, you know, we've always had usually MLS teams be able to come to to campus uh, in the past, the Timbers had had this four-team MLS tournament, so we would host two teams in in late January, mid February, and uh, now they're all going to uh, sunny California. So we've had to pivot a little bit, but it was great. We played Vancouver Whitecaps two, and we played Pacific um, in the past. We've played Portland Timbers, their second team, South Sounders. We've had a lot of MLS club team, you know, MLS clubs on 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 campus over the years and unfortunate to play those guys so the cpl teams have been great you know we're, we're fortunate we're only about four and a half hours south of, of vancouver and there, there's a couple teams there last year we had calgary um, who did very well in, in that cpl league come down and they did a 10-day preseason so you know it's been great to, to host teams over the years here on campus and then as we've kind of moved into the division one portion of our schedule we've created uh pacific northwest cup with University of Washington, Oregon State, Seattle U and ourselves, I think four, you know, top 25 teams, really good soccer up here in the Northwest. And so we'll have our last match this weekend uh, against University of Washington. And, and that's been fun. I think playing for, for something in the spring uh, is really meaningful and um, just have so much respect for all of these programs up here and, and the level of competition that we have. Yeah, definitely. I think you put it very well there in the end of the level of competition you guys have in the spring is, you know, in some ways unmatched, you know, obviously experiencing against the pro clubs. And then, you know, like you mentioned there, four top 25 programs almost year in, year out there. So I'll start with the pro section of it. I mean, obviously, and you mentioned it there, have you guys have had the experiences for multiple years now kind of playing against MLS clubs and maybe their second teams. And, you know, what do you think that does for your players in terms of having that exposure of the next level and, you know, kind of, you can see the differences personally you know, in terms of a match in a setting like that, how do you think that benefits your players? I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. I think it's uh there's, there's a couple parts to, to that answer. You know, one is just that, you know, a lot of our guys want to be pros. So it's a measuring stick, especially when we can play first teams. You know, we played Minnesota United. We've played real salt Lake. Uh, we played Chicago Fire first teams uh, since I've been here. And, you know, they're playing guys who are, who are playing to, to make the roster for preseason uh, opportunities and so it's it's a high level match um our guys get to measure themselves against you know the, the best uh talent in our country and then they get some exposure as well right and so i think sometimes the opposing coach gets to see the way that we play or some individual profiles or, or what we're all about but more than anything it's just in, in the spring where there's kind of this this idea that you know college soccer is only three months which couldn't be further from the truth is a chance for us to, to really have a goal in mind and, and and put together a good performance against a professional team, regardless of result, just to push yourself. I think the guys that we have in our locker, they need that. They, they need to be pushed. They need to, to have some real tangible goals in the spring as a team. While, while we very much focus on the individual player development here in the spring, I also think it's a it's an early look to see, hey, what can the team be uh, heading into the fall? Where are we strong? What? How do we replace guys who've, who've gone pro or graduated? And then it, it's a way for us tactically, I think, as well to experiment and, and try different things, which is, I think, fun for coaches and players. Yeah, definitely. I think you put it well there and kind of talking about the individual player development, like you mentioned, but also you know, kind of the team development, you know, tactically. I think a lot of coaches try stuff and experiment with ideas that I think you might see over a longer portion in the fall. But, you know, you've talked about development quite a bit through that. And I think the 
aspect of individual development and team development. But, you know, from the perspective of your players, having all these matches against such high quality competition, how much do you think that does for their player development in terms of just the competition versus the pro clubs and then also, you know, a competitive environment in a, you know, a cup setting? Yeah, it's important. I mean, I think one of the great things about being on a college campus and a school like University of Portland, which which I absolutely love, a, a small, intimate, you know, highly um, intellectual environment is that players are having the human development as well. And so we want them to grow as people. We want them to grow as students. We want them to grow as young men. We want them to, to be great ambassadors in the community. Um, and so the spring is a little bit more time without as much travel um, for them to you know, really find interests, you know, I know we're talking about soccer a lot, but really find interests outside of soccer and grow academically, grow as, grow as a human being. Um, I think that's one of the, the things I still so much still believe about this model is that, uh, you know, I don't care where you are in the world, you can only do football three to four hours a day while coaches are doing it, you know, all the time. Uh, as a student athlete, you really get to be that here. Um, focus on your academics, really focus on kind of, who you are going to be as a human being and, and and what are you doing to grow? And so our guys have created a lot of different clubs, a book club, uh, a Bible study, you know, whatever that may be. Um, we have so much beauty outside here in the Northwest for, for, for just to expose our players to, to, to life outside of soccer. But then of course they're here for football. And so um, just challenging, you know, challenging themselves. A lot of times, you know, I've been proud of the development of of guys who've had to wait their turn. I'm still old school in that sense. Like I like to recruit four year kids and and develop them, and and they learn from the seniors and the tradition and the culture is is passed on um, from one class to the next, and and they learn from those who come before them the same way I have. Um, so I think that's like a great opportunity for guys to, you know, really make an argument for an expanded role. And what better way than to see that against some of the best competition, both in, in Division One and then against some of the professional teams? You know, professional teams play a little bit different than some of the college teams, so that 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 part is is also really exciting. You know, they're trying to to boss the game with the ball and dominate. Not saying college teams don't, um, but I think you're seeing more teams build out of the back consistently uh, in in the professional ranks. Partly, maybe some of some of those teams at the at the, at the development model, they don't have as many consequences. Um, you know, as, as, as a college team or a first team where you, know, you got to win on the weekend. Um, but that part's just fun. It's just fun to to play different teams. We end up playing a lot of the same teams in the fall, uh, but to see different teams to to also for a learning for, for, for myself and our staff. You know, we've had AC Milan on campus. We've had Bayern Munich when Pep was here in the All-Star game before I was here, actually here. But um, being able to see a lot of these these groups work and these coaches work. I remember when Greg Berhalter was here and he spent four days with the Columbus crew. Um, I remember when Bruce Arena was here and, and, and they did preseason with New England Revolution. So we just had so many, you know, great soccer minds and great coaches come through that, you know, for me as a coach, that's been a real treat. Yeah, definitely. Obviously so much to get into there. And I think what you say at the end there is a very fantastic point of just that continuous learning. And you talk about the different game models, the professional level. I think that's a great example. And like you said, you know, an experience versus Vancouver Whitecaps too. I'm sure their game model is a lot different than an experience against a, you know, a Canadian first team where they might be, you know, maybe experimenting a little more and being a little more progressive in the preseason. Ultimately, they're getting ready to get results throughout the course of the season. So I think that's a fantastic point there. And also, you're just talking about the human development aspect. I think that's another thing that a lot of times goes on. People don't speak about as much in college. And I think obviously you're in a setting where a lot of players are trying to progress on in their careers and, you know, be professionals. But, you know, also, like you mentioned there, you can only play three hours, four hours a day, maybe. So, you know, to develop as a human being, obviously, over the course of your college career, but also, you know, during the springtime, I think is a fantastic point. Shifting gears a little bit in a different direction in this conversation, I want to talk about a little bit of your background and your playing career. And I know you had some experiences even trying to break into the pro level and wanted to talk about, you know, how that kind of unfolded throughout the course of your career and also how that kind of impacted you in becoming a coach. Yeah, I think I have a very non-traditional uh, background, you know, to to get to this chair in the sense of, you know, I didn't have uh, UCLA or even University of Portland or, you know, one of these big schools. Uh, I didn't play at one of these big schools, but I'm very proud of where I played, my experience. It, I think it's the main reason that I'm here, you know, honestly. So it's it's a long story, but, you know, to make a, a long story short, 
I was a two sport athlete growing up. I was a goalkeeper. Um, they didn't, we didn't have the same system that they have now. Um, but I loved basketball when I was 16, 17, as, as much as I did soccer. You know, I was fortunate to have some great coaches growing up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, really rich history of, of coaches and, and players on the soccer side who came through that. And you know, I thought I wanted to go to one of these big division one schools. And, um, you know, I wasn't honestly recruited by all of them. I had some division one offers. Uh, when push came to shove, I wanted to continue to be a two sport athlete in college, uh, stay local. I was raised by a single mom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and you know, got a great uh, opportunity to go to Kalamazoo College, which at the time was you know, a top 20 division three school. Um, was able to start right away as, as a goalkeeper in that program. And, um, but also like the academic, my dad's a doctor. And so they have a great pre-med. I was either going to be a doctor or a teacher coach like I am now, like my mom. And, um, you know, I, I was hoping to walk on to Notre Dame. That ended up not happening. Uh, unfortunately, the coach passed away. And, you know, I was fortunate to, to go to Kalamazoo College, have a great experience, play on uh, some top teams, uh, lucky enough to be an All-American there. Ended up after my sophomore year, giving up basketball, saying, hey, I need to, I need to get more technical. I need to really focus on, on my craft and in, in, in soccer. And I had some really good experiences at IMG Academy and found a really incredible goalkeeper coach at Scott Morgan Roth, who at that time was with the U-17 national team and, and just exposure that I had down there just kind of opened my eyes to, to higher level uh, training and environments. And um, that time it was the Bulletary Academy. And, you know, it's funny, I just was back down there at the GA Cup and that place has changed so much. So, um, you know, that was, a, that was a great experience. I think I probably went further in the game than, than I thought I would. Um, and then, you know, had some real short stints uh, in Germany and Mexico and, you know, take the experiences that I learned there with me in terms of when I was in Ostenbrook, there was an American there, Joey Knox. Um, I went on trial there and uh, it was a great experience, but it, it wasn't called Gingham Preston at that time, but you could just see the level of intensity against the ball in, in German football, even in the third division, the fourth division, or the fifth division, the Oberliga, and, and the intensity and the pressing. And, you know, that just, that was different than I had been exposed to in, in the States and how hard everyone worked and how hard they worked together. And, you know, that influence from Klopp that you, you've you seen in, in, in German football is fantastic. And so I try to bring that to the team here. And then, you know, I did a study abroad program. I was in college in Oaxaca, Mexico, a really beautiful uh, part of Mexico, and then went back uh, and, and, and tried to catch on with the a La Liga A team there, uh, Cruz Azul, Oaxaca. Um, it was the Chaplin Arrows at the time, and, and and that was an incredible experience. And I and I learned at that point too. It was a Argentinian U twenty three national team goalie that I just I wasn't good enough, you know. And I think every player comes comes to that realization at some time. And then down there, I I actually tore my PCL, um, and that kind of put a an end to the the playing career at, at twenty three. And but you saw the way that they trained in Mexico and and, and the focus on on, on technical ball possession, uh, different rotations, but how much time they spent with the ball uh, was incredible. I think I've tried to marry those two ideas uh, of possession, free-flowing, passing football with high pressing uh, against the ball, very you know tough steel in the spine football that, that we try to incorporate here. We don't always pull it off, but um, that, that marrying those ideas of passing and pressing from some of my playing experiences, you know, even, you know, far back to, you know, 2005. Um, I still, I still think about those things today. Yeah. Obviously a lot to get into there. And I think you know, that shows is a perfect example of kind of the environment, you know, you're around kind of shape your ideals and your visions of the game. And, you know, your background, I know is very interesting in the fact, in the fact that you did play two sports for so long growing up. And, you know, I'm curious, that's kind of a lost art in the modern modern world we live in you know there's such a specialization kind of taking place of people you know committing to one sport at a very early age and I think there's a lot of benefits to get lost in playing multiple sports in terms of the coordination and just different movements you know for yourself how do you think that kind of affected your personal development in terms of playing another sport and having to you know learn different coordinations and also you know maybe not having to deal with something like burnout as much because you had two sports that didn't you know were able to take your mind in different places I mean, I think in, growing up in Western Michigan, um, you know, we didn't, the, the big clubs there were Vardar and the Wolves. And so if I was going to do that, that was a three hour car ride each way to practice. 
So I think there's still this idea in American soccer that there's still so many pockets that that don't have big ECNL clubs or don't have uh, DA or MLS next you know academies. And we had a great guy there who you know, played in Indiana, Chris Keenan, and you know he always brought top players uh, in the summer in, in in what was called the PDL team. And so I was able to train with that team, you know, in high school. And you see guys who are playing on the full national team or you know still still coaching today in MLS were were on that team and. That was great exposure um, for me. As a goalkeeper, I think it's a little bit different because the hand-eye coordination uh, in, in that era, there was so many successful goalkeepers. You know, they were the first ones kind of to break in into Europe at a high level and stay. Uh, the Brad Friels, the Casey Kellers, the Tony Miolos of the world. And so, you know, I just, I loved um, that aspect of it, uh, that action aspect of it. Um, and I think that, you know, there's pros and cons like anything. You didn't have the technical development with your feet uh, that, you know, that the kids have now. Uh, the goalkeeping positions changed. You know, it's it's much more uh, involved in build up play. And, you know, the rules have changed in the game. I remember when I was growing up, you could you could pick up a back pass. I'm not that old, but, you know, the rules have changed a lot for the goalkeeper. And so I think, you know, you've seen uh, the focus of what a goalkeeper should be. I was actually having that conversation with Casey Keller the other day, and they said, well, you know, if it's just about who has the best feet as a goalkeeper, let's just play the number 10 there. And, uh, you know, he's like, I've played, you know, in all the major leagues in the world and, you know, I was never the number 10. So, you know, the, the job of the goalkeeper is still pretty simple. Keep the ball in the back of the net. Um, but I think in terms of of, of development, there's just there, there, the game has grown a lot in our country. Uh, it's become much more technical. Um, you know, we've we've tried to be a team. And I think you see this now with the full national team a team that can control more games with the ball that can dictate the rhythm of the game. Um, and, and I think that's a, that's an important progression, you know, in, in, in the history of our country. And it'll be interesting to see in the world cup, you know, against the best of the best can, can we impose our game model on other teams? But it, it's a loaded question you ask in terms of, you know, I, when you played for your high school and you put a, uh, your high school Jersey on, you know, that meant something there was pack stands and, you know, there's rivalry games and that element of competition, I, I think, you know, and again, the game has changed, but I see some of these academy games now and, you know, there's 30 people there and if you win, great. If not, no, no big deal. You know, I don't, you don't see a lot of knockout games. You don't see a lot of now when you're recruiting players, like moments where they're high pressure, where they have to win or they go home, uh, knockout games. And so, you know, I think that element of, of competition is still still so important in development and we can't miss that that element of, of winning and competition yeah definitely and that's a topic i really want to dive in later and you know talking about adjustments throughout the the u.s game and you know, i still want to focus a little bit on your background and i think the other thing that's really interesting about your background is your exposure to the higher levels of the game kind of came late in your playing career and i think sometimes that can actually be beneficial in terms of progressing down the lines, like you obviously have in becoming a coach and that you saw, like you mentioned there, you know, working with a high level goalie coach and kind of exposing your brain to how much more there is to the game and also your exposure in Germany and Mexico. How do you think, you know, having that exposure kind of later in your career kind of shaped you into the coach you were today in terms of like the ideas were more fresh and also, you know, maybe wanted you to press on a little bit more and maybe expanded your curiosity as well? I think the key word there is being curious. I think we we try to preach that to our players here, but you know I've fallen in love with the game when I was five and can't get enough of it. Watch it, uh, study it, try to travel abroad, try to keep growing as a coach, keep trying to grow as a leader. And so the game is is so interesting at the highest levels now, and uh, the, there's so many different trends and in, in, in tactical setups. Uh, and the game's still simple, right? At the end of the day, the, you know the game is only complicated by players and coaches, but I think you see um, there's there's really a level of intellectualism uh, and a complexity that you're trying to make simple and teach those, those principles to a team. And there's so many different ways to do it. There's so many different ways to play around the world uh, and get results. And I think it doesn't matter what you do as long as you believe in it and you, and you have a conviction and you can sell that and um, you, you die by that brand, I think is is, is so important. But you know, I've had to work for everything that, that I've had, I think, like any any college coach, you know, when I started at the bottom, I was a division three assistant coach for free. I worked up as a, a volunteer in division one and went on this big kind of coaching journey, um, which has been great. And I've 
had so many rich experiences. You know, I started off at, at George Mason University with Greg Andrewless, who was an MLS head coach. I think he was the only head coach from the MLS in college at that time. And so he was, you know, had a lot of success with the Columbus crew and had so many successful assistant coaches, Chris Kelderman, Clint PA, Dave Tenney, all guys who've been in the MLS, Kenny Arena, and, and, and kind of getting in into that network and that coaching tree uh, was really beneficial for me just in terms of learning and development and um, seeing Greg taught me how to run a program, you know, how to nuts and bolts, not just have a good team, but, but run a program from alumni to fundraising, to recruiting, to player development, to man management. You know, he, he had different experiences than others and had been in the game a long time. And so that was a great start um, being there for five years and, you know, going up against some of the, the best programs in the country, but also being in talent rich DC, there's just so much talent there. there there's it's such a multicultural place. It's just a really interesting place to live. Uh, so many smart people and, and and people that are just, again, really passionate about what they're doing in the game and, and outside of the game. So that was a, a great start for me on the men's side in Division One. Yeah, I think you sum it up perfectly there. And I think, you know, talking about the talent rich area is a very good point and talking about D.C., but also just talking about how lucky you were to be in that environment, and how much you need to learn. And I think that's a great way to put it for any assistant coach or any aspiring coaches you know, find an environment like that and soak up the knowledge as much as you can. And, you know, obviously I think it's done you very well. I think you frame it very well there and how much it's benefited you. And, you know, I want to move into that next stop on your coaching journey and, you know, that time you had at UCLA. And obviously I know you guys had a lot of success in terms of the team and also sending players on to the next level. But, you know, if you could just talk a little bit about that experience over your coaching career and how you think that kind of shaped you, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, it was a dream come true to to move out West. I'd always wanted to live in California you know, I grew up with my mom writing John Wooden quotes on my lunchbox and, you know, grew up a fan of of UCLA basketball. And then obviously UCLA soccer is, you know, the the bluest of the blue and the history, the alumni who come through the program, uh, the tradition of excellence, uh, the type of football I think that they played uh, in the past and, and currently is has always been a standard in college soccer. And being part of that program and, and trying to leave it better than I found it was awesome. We had some really good players. I learned so much being there. We failed, learned things that didn't work, learned things that worked. You know, had the opportunity to coach just some incredible human beings, you know, number one draft pick in MLS or the Herman Trophy winner, but also, you know, guys who've gone on to medical school at Yale and and, and just um, being on campus every day. Uh, I think it's the most applied to school in the country. And so... Um, that part was awesome. Regular visits from Real Madrid or, or Barcelona and just the exposure to, to that level, trying to win a national championship, you know, trying to constantly figure out how you're going to build a team with guys going pro and leaving school early. And, 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 and I'm just figuring out that talent rich area of, of Southern California um, was, was, it was a great experience. I think that prepared me really well uh, for being here. I did four or five years at both places, George Mason and UCLA. I've never been one to to jump around much, you know, and you, you got close to winning a national championship. We lost in penalty kicks. Um, yeah, then the opportunity it's presented itself here, and uh, I felt like I was ready to take the next step, run my own program, and, and kind of implement a vision that I wanted to, to have here at the University of Portland. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think – both these stops now, and you know, as your time as an assistant coach, I think you put very well in terms of, you know, kind of the lessons and takeaways you learned and, you know, that expectation, like you mentioned there at UCLA, of competing for a national title every year. I mean, I know you guys have that now. And then, you know, again, talking about working in a talent-rich area and, you know, learning to recruit, you know, learning different game models, everything like that, I think compares very well with your time at George Mason, I'm sure, you know, shaped you very well into, you know, becoming a head coach. And you know, I do want to talk about those first few years at Portland too. And, you know, if you could just talk about maybe kind of a little bit of the growing pains and maybe being a head coach for the first time and some of the things you kind of learned, because, you know, I think, you know, anyone throughout the college game that's an assistant coach, anyone that might have aspirations is, you know, becoming a coach, you know, obviously the goal is probably to become a head coach and, you know, you might have to do your dues and earn your time as an assistant coach, but, you know, kind of what that, what was that transition for you like in terms of, you know, going from an assistant coach to a head coach for the first time? That was really exciting. I've been waiting for the opportunity for, you know, over a decade. And I think like any young assistant coach, you probably think you're ready sooner than you are. 
Um, but there, there's no experience like actually being in that chair and and then building what you want to build. And, and first of all, it comes with understanding the past of the program. And, you know, Clive Charles is, is the godfather of the program. He, he not only in Portland or the Northwest, but really in the country, you know, he, he really is beloved and, you know, built, built this program into, into what it is today. And so we still in, in every way possible are teaching our current players about the past and all of those who've, who've come before us and, and Harry Merlot building the field and, you know, the women winning two national championships and the, the endless list of players who've gone on to play in the Olympics and the world cup here at UP and, you know, really university of Portland is on, is on the map uh, because of soccer. Right. And so uh, I, I saw that tradition. I saw that history. Uh, we understood that we respected that we wanted to tap into that, but we also wanted to, to be in the present and, and form a legacy for these guys, because when, when they left, we didn't want them to talk about something that happened, you know, before they arrived. So, you know, I think the goals of the program and, and the saying that, you know, was put into place long before I arrived here was, was leave the program better than you found it. And every year we're preaching that to the guys. The first year we hit the ground running. We went, we went, I think we went from one of the worst teams in the country, three wins, 180 in the RPI to, you know, top 25 program. We won the league. Uh, we're in the tournament and I thought it would be easy to win, win, the, win the conference every year, you know, and that hasn't happened, but uh, it's a really competitive conference. Um, we've elevated the program since then. We've gotten stronger. I think we play in better soccer. I think we've sent more guys to the pros. We've gone much deeper in the tournament. Um, but just this, I think this, this idea of legacy and, you know, we taught our guys in 1988 when Friedel, Wiggins, Keller were here and we didn't have Merlot Field and, and Portland beat UCLA in, in a muddy rainy day in the playoffs. Clive Charles versus Ziggy Smith that, you know, if we had won that game and Harry Merlot wasn't there, I don't know if Merlot Stadium would, would, would be here today. So um, we tap into those ideas and then, you know, get in our first win against UCLA in the playoffs at home. Uh, since then in, in 2018 was, was massive for the program. Uh, but just the idea of of how do you build the, the program on culture? How do you build the program on teamwork? That's one of the things I really learned at George Mason. And the years that we were, I think, overachieved at UCLA was due to the team. And the years that we underachieved, I think, was due to the disease of me. And so I really wanted to create a culture where the team was a star and no one was more important than the team. And this idea also that we wanted to entertain the fans. You know, we have a great fan base here. We have like a European tradition where where fans march into the stadium they're playing drums they have scarves there's smoke bombs it's it's an incredible environment but we also want to entertain them and we want to be connected with them off the field and so if someone's going to pay you know fifteen dollars to come watch us play we want to have an idea of of entertaining them and, and playing exciting football and scoring goals and you know goals change matches so um i think we we've we've tried to incorporate that into into our style of play of of we have to connect with our fans as who we are as people, what we stand for, how we go about our business, but also how we play and can they identify with our work rate and how hard we're going and how hard we're pushing. And, you know, we're going for it every game, whether we win or lose, we feel like uh, we want to push the tempo of the match and we want to try to be, you know, on the front foot. Um, and I think that brand is is exciting to current players and future players. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so many good points and I think so much, so many important aspects you touched on there. I mean, the cultural aspect of kind of taking from before, like you mentioned there, I think is so important for any program and acknowledging the traditions and history you have, I think is so important in terms of, you know, like you mentioned a little bit prior, you know, connecting with old alumni, but also kind of establishing your own legacy, like you mentioned there. And, you know, something that I think really stands out about University of Portland and yourself personally is you guys have continued to recruit so many high level players. And yet you've touched on so much throughout the course of this conversation of, you know, the aspect of culture. And it seems to be so strong at Portland. And I'm curious, you know, how do you find that kind of balance of bringing in so many top players? Not to say that all top players have this me mentality, but sometimes it can be difficult if you're such a top player to not be thinking about progressing on in your career and whatnot. So, you know, how have you been able to find such a good balance of finding players to put the team first and, you know, relate with your ideals and the things you want to accomplish, but also such talented players in the process as well? I think just, just relationships. My mom taught me that a long time ago is everything's about relationships. And so making sure the players know that you have their best interests in mind. Well, the, the team is the most important, you know, and um, 
the team wins always and every decision is made to, to benefit the team but individuals have goals and aspirations and, and you have to address those and manage those and a lot of those can be ego driven you know and I think ego is the enemy uh, in, in, in a lot of ways for team building. And so it's getting players to understand that, you know, the more that they give, the more that they receive. And I look at the patience that we have to have in development. And I think everyone kind of thinks development is a straight line, but development is is messy. And there's there's good moments, there's tough moments, there's moments of disappointment, there's moments of injury, uh, there's moments of underperformance. And I think some of the, you know, the guys who, who've gone right from our locker into MLS teams, and we're proud of that fact, they maybe didn't have the most success right away, right? And they maybe weren't household names when they came here. And so, you know, I think a guy like Brandon Cambridge had one goal, I think, in two years here. And then his, his junior year, he exploded for, you know, 12 or 13. Uh, I was proud of Buba Fofana's progression last year. And he went from one goal to nine. Uh, the Lens Pierre came in. And he didn't start, you know, his, his first year and he had to earn that and he didn't play the position he wanted. Uh, and he just kept giving to the team, never said boo and, you know, kept developing and focusing on what he had control over. There's other guys like Kevin Bonilla, who was a blue chip recruit and, and a lot of schools wanted him, but he got better here, right? Like, I think he was always one of these really fun, exciting, attacking outside backs, but he became such a better defender here um, during his time. That's a credit to him. Uh, and the work that he had to to go from our team and, and get signed to an MLS team. So I think each guy has a different story. Um, but a lot of times with attacking guys, like I look at a Jacob Babala, I mean, he walked onto our program, uh, didn't even play in the academy, local product from Oregon, didn't play for two years, went on to to be the leading goal scorer in the conference and drafted 41 by Charlotte this year. And so, you know, I'm really proud of, of kind of finding those um, – under the radar guys, those guys who are maybe missed to have a little chip on their shoulder. And then they put in their dues in the program. They put in their sweat equity and they keep grinding and developing and they learn from the guys that are a little bit older than them. And then once their time to shine, I feel like, man, they're ready. They've been waiting um, and they have a pathway. And then I think that tradition gets passed on, you know, like a Nick Fernandez. Um, he was a good player when he came here, but he was, he wasn't a box to box attacking midfielder like he is now um and and i wish sometimes our younger guys would realize that that like you know it doesn't happen right away we all want things right away but sometimes uh it takes a little bit of time and it can take two or three seasons i think most of the guys who've gone to mls from here they've had a real big junior year you know like they, they've had some mixed first couple years they've they've stayed true to the program they've stayed committed to their teammates and they learn those lessons. And then that junior year in a lot of ways was a breakout. Now there's of course guys who broke out their freshman year and did really well, but um, I think you see it in development across all countries in the world. The guys that are their best at 17, they're rarely the best at 20, right? Like there's there's some examples, some some exceptions of course, but I mean, look how many guys on the national team now who, who never played on a U17 World Cup. Um, and so, I think the, the 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 exciting thing for any young player in football is like your life can change fast. You know, your life can change fast and, and you have a really good season here and the team does well and, and you're made of the right stuff. Like there's going to be pro teams watching us. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think so many very good points there to touch off again. And, you know, something you mentioned at the start of this conversation, again, was your kind of old school in your approach and developing and, you know, these four year guys and, I think that goes hand in hand with, with what you kind of talk about there. And not to say that it's that much, that prevalent throughout college soccer of guys being one and done. I think it's especially committed to other sports. It's not, but I think the transfer portal has also changed stuff in the way team aspects are kind of built. And I think that speaks again to the model you guys have at Portland and that, you know, development is put first. And I know you guys have tapped into the transfer portal a little bit more in recent years, but again, that aspect of development is put so much first. And, you know, I'm curious from the player perspective too. I think, you know, you talked about how many, so many of your guys have these aspirations to become professionals and you know having that ingrained in the culture of that you need to put in time and kind of what the formula is to kind of push on in the next level how much do you think that helps of that you've had so many guys kind of come through this and you know take two or three years or even sometimes the whole time to develop but then also find success at the professional level especially considering you know you guys are recruiting so many top level MLS next guys each each cycle it seems 
Well, I think, you know, you got to be honest with guys in the recruiting process and um, it's not going to be easy here, right? Like you're, you're going to have to earn it. There's going to be another guy in your position fighting. I'm never going to promise you playing time or a starting position. I'm not going to say that in the recruiting process. I'm surely not going to say that when you're here. I just don't think that, you know, the foundation of the program is competitive greatness. It's in our locker room, you know, it comes from Wooden's pyramid of success. You have to, you have to earn it. You know, nothing's going to be given here. Nothing's been given to, to any coach, any administrator, any player, any alumni. You have, you have to earn it. And if you go to a pro team, there's going to be more than just one or two more guys in your position. There could be four or five, six deep. So I think, you know, in, in, in all ways, um, iron sharpens iron and, and, and top players want to play with other top players. And so if you're afraid of the competition that we're going to have here, you're never going to make it as a pro and you're, you're probably not going to be very successful in life. You know, I want guys who are grinders, who work hard, who, who bring their lunchbox to work every day and, you know, fight for the jersey. And this idea that, you know, I want to be a pro, that's like, you know, the sky is blue too. Like, like of course you want to be a pro. You know, everyone wants to be a pro. And I don't think it's not something that we talk about too much as a group. You know, like we talk about winning for Portland and how do we elevate this program and how do we accomplish things that haven't been accomplished before us, which we're proud of. We've, we've been able to check some of those boxes off. And then if you do well here, like you're going to have pro opportunities. Like teams are going to watch. We're 15 minutes from a first team stadium. We have a lot of guys coming through to watch, watch our team. You look at the guys in the past who, who've gone on to pro, but those, those guys were all part of successful teams. They were all part of successful culture. They're all part of teams who achieved and, and did well in the tournament or made the tournament and, you know, won games here. And so um, I think that's, that's the recipe is development. Uh, and if you're good enough, like someone's going to come and extract you from the environment. You can't force that, right? Like to play the first, to play in an MLS team or a first division team abroad, like you can't force that. You know, they, they will come and find you. Games are on Y Scout. The game is very visible. Teams are watching games. Um, and, I, and I think sometimes, you know, these young players, they have a lot of exposure to the pro team because they're training with second team. A lot of our guys have, you know, been training with first teams or gone the preseason. But that doesn't mean you're a professional. You know, there's a big difference between training and actually playing in matches and, and, and having a contract. And so, again, there, there's no one size fits all for every player. Um, the most important thing is that the players know that the coaches are behind them and they're going to support their dreams and aspirations. We're never going to get in the way or stop someone from, from leaving school early. I think generally it takes longer than, than, than players think. Um, I've tried to stay away from the one and done guys, but I don't think that builds culture. I don't think that builds continuity. We've had some transfers, of course, I think in, in, when you talk about roster construction, but some of them have done well. Uh, it's harder just to like plug and play and, and come in for three months and really impact the group. I think we've used the transfer portal probably when we've lost guys who have gone pro uh, more times than not guys who've been committed and then sign and, and end up not showing up, uh, which is, you know, I thought I would get away from that at leaving UCLA and you know, that part's still, still here. I think that's there for probably every college program as there's more options in our country, there's over a hundred professional teams. And so all we want to do is, is be another development model, uh, both on and off the field where guys can be the best they can be, where guys can unlock their full potential. And I think, you know, if you're unlocking your full potential in your everyday life, you're probably doing that in soccer. If, if you're sloppy off the field and you're sloppy in the classroom and you're not taking care of business there, there's going to be a time on the field where you're sloppy and, you know, you don't have the details, you know, the tension, the focus, to be the best you can be. And, you know, all we want to do is try to create an environment where you can be the best you can be every day. And then there's an environment that pushes you and holds each other accountable to, for everyone to strive to do that. Yeah. Again, so much, so many fantastic points to touch on there. And again, I'm glad you mentioned that there at the end. I mean, I know it's a little bit cliche, but you know, again, if you're being the best version of yourself in every aspect of your life, it'll carry over on the field. And, you know, before we start any, up, any other conversation up here, I know this Zoom meeting has about a minute left, so I'm just going to end it here, and then I have another link ready to send to you. So Great. I'll send it over in about a minute or so. Thanks. Awesome. Getting back to the conversation, I know, you know, it's something we've alluded to a few times throughout this conversation, and I know it's something you brought up prior to, but I just wanted to talk about know what you think you know especially with some of the recent adaptations of the game some of the things you might need to think we might need to adjust throughout the game here in the U.S. Mm. or even the college mm. game specifically yeah this is one point I thought about when we we ended the conversation a little bit earlier just in terms of 
development is one of the things we really look for here is guys who are like, we love kind of recruiting first generation college students, right? And I think we have the highest proportion of on, on campus. And so a guy like Ray Ortiz, who, who knows, his mom unfortunately passed away when he was in high school and who's the first one in his family to graduate. Uh, those stories for me, and I think any college coach would tell you and in, in seeing those guys now later in life, they're just awesome just to see them use the college experience. Yeah, Ray played in the MLS for a year and played professionally for a couple, but I think the lessons that he, that, that anyone can learn in, in, in college soccer, so important. And I still, still so much believe in that model here because it's giving opportunities to some guys maybe who've been missed. I think it's a loaded question in terms of, um, you know, what changes are needed. I think there's a lot of changes that, you know, listen, you need to continue to evolve or, or you're going to die. And so I think the substitution rules is, is a step in the right direction. I think coaches will have to, to be savvier in terms of, you know, how much energy they ex exert pressing, you know, how they use their substitutions. I think it's going to be really fascinating. Um, personally, I wish there was no re-entry at all. I think you could sub as much as you want, but no re-entry, but I think it's a, it's a good step in the right direction. You know, the reality is our sport hasn't had much progress in terms of the rules and regulations in, in, a, in a long time. And so that part's been good. Um, obviously the two semester model I think is needed. I'm, I'm not optimistic it'll be passed, but I, I would love uh, for that to come into place where you're preparing for one game a week. You know, I think we all did that in COVID and we do that in the spring and that's great. You know, you play 12 games in the fall and you have your national championship in the spring. Um, we need to get to a place where the college cup is, is a destination and it's, it's a packed house. I think of lacrosse and softball and um, volleyball and the other Olympic sports can figure this out. I think I think men's and women's soccer should be able to as well. You know, when we had the days of the Final Four being in Richmond, 20,000 people were there and they left it there. And that was, you know, that was the destination. You look at baseball in Omaha. Um, I think that's got to be a culmination. It, it can't be a place where you go to and there's 4,000 people at the game and, and the stadium's empty. Like we have to celebrate college soccer and promote it because, you know, look at, look at all the successful players and programs that we have and, and the quality of play is only getting better in college. Um, even with uh, so many domestic players going pro earlier. I think it's a, in, in terms of, you know, where college soccer stands, um, it, it's, it's one we're having to fight for respect every day. Right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm I think it's great that you're you're doing this and you're giving some exposure to college. I think it's one where we can tell our story better as a community and, and come together and and really celebrate, you know, all the great players that we've had who've who've come through all these different programs and all the really successful coaches. I still look in the MLS and and, and some of the best and brightest coaches have come through college, both as players, uh, assistant coaches. Uh, and, and that part is, is, is I think, should be celebrated. Uh, we have Steve Trundolo, you know, who's the LAFC head coach. And, you know, from Bruce to Ziggy to Bob Bradley, uh, the godfathers of of kind of the American coaches in pro soccer all, all cut their teeth in college, not just for a few years, but, you know, for decades. The game has changed, of course. Um, I think we need to take the training wheels off and, and, and really let college coaches work with players in the summer. You can do that in basketball, right? Like you can have Kara, you can you can train your team four to eight hours. I, I, a lot of our players are here for summer school, but we can't, you know, we can't coach them. I think that part, we, we, we need to have an evolution there. I think the American player is suffering too in terms of, you know, if you compare them to a lot of the European counterparts, like these European guys can play in reserve games and, you know, they can, they can play in levels that I think that are similar, not higher than MLS Next Pro and then still go to college. You know, I like to see a, a place where these guys aren't making much money in MLS Next Pro, where maybe every year that you play in MLS Next Pro is just one year that you couldn't play in college. But there's got to be a way for some of these kids who are 16 and 17 who sign, uh, don't make a lot of money, uh, but they're technically professionals to come back and explore college soccer. I think that would be a good thing. I think deregulating some of the ability for the players in the summer to, to play in more meaningful games. You know, for example, like Kevin Bonilla, when he was here, he could play 20 games uh, in USL League One before he came here and keep his eligibility. I think he played 20 games with North Texas. But once he's here, then in the summer, he can't play any more games with North Texas. Why could he, why should we not allow him to play as an amateur, right? As long as he's not receiving money, why can he not? I mean, and now with NLI, I mean, 
the NFL draft was last night, the, the, what, what these guys that, you know, they're making and earning and they're still playing college sports. I just think there's got to be a way for us to link up more with the pro teams, the minor league teams, one, so they can make better decisions. You know, if they bring a player in and, and they play 10 games in the summer, they really are going to know what they are. Um, and so I think that's that's a way that we could continue to grow the game. I think it's good just adding another week to the to this, the fall season this year allowed us to fit one more game in, not cram our schedule. Um, but there's also a lot of things that are really good in college soccer, right? I think it's still the only development model in, in the world where you combine high-level academics and soccer and, and you bring any European or any international over and, you know, they see our facilities, they see what our players have. They say, what division pro team is this? Like they can't believe it's amateur. Right. And so, um, you know, I think college soccer is under attack a little bit. Um, I think as a community, we can come together, you know, and uh, fly that flag and, and then just understand that uh, we have to continue to evolve with the rules. We have to continue to evolve with, you know, our players being able to do what they love to do, which is train, right? And, and you know, we give our players a lot of you can'ts, uh, a lot of restrictions. If you compare us to the drama student across campus or, you know, the, the, the gentleman playing the saxophone in the in, in, in the jazz ensemble, look, they, they can they can train, they can play. Um, they can have more than six concerts uh, in a spring. And so having more games in the spring, having more meaningful games in the spring, I think is is important. Um, and then trying to be able to push the boundaries a little bit in the summer months where, you know, USL League 2 is great. We use that. It's not for everybody. Um, but I think some of the risk college coaches have is that season goes pretty late into the summer. A lot of guys can come back injured, you know, and so a lot of coaches just pull their players back, start, you know, July and, and they get them on campus and uh, they're in summer school. They're, they're making progress towards a degree but there, there's not a soccer component in, in that. And I think that's a hole in the development model where, you know, it doesn't have to be year round, but, you know, we're six, seven months now. Could that push to, to nine months? Um, I think would would be beneficial for the players because at the end of the day, it's all about the players. Yeah, definitely. Again, I think so many fantastic points in that. And, and you, you speak about more meaningful games, you know, more meaningful just activity, I think in general, it's a fantastic point, you know, being, I call it soccer myself. I see it. I see all the restrictions. I see having to go, you know, jump through so many hoops and bounds just to, you know, get meaningful games or find meaningful activity. And, you know, something that you touched on quite a bit throughout this, and I know this might be a bit of a complex question, but, you know, you speak about Kevin Bonilla's situation. And, you know, I know quite a few other players who have been in similar situations either with MLS Next Pro or, you know, back when it was USL 1 and their MLS Next Pro didn't exist. But do you think there should be some sort of, relationship between pro clubs and college in terms of allowing you know some of the pro players who like you mentioned there might have signed and maybe didn't pan out to go to college or you know a college eligible player who's performing really well and you know might have an opportunity to implement himself throughout the professional game long term do you think that's something that's achievable or is that just too slippery of a slope to maybe die? i think we, we should you know combine resources i mean look at a duncan mcguire right like he, he didn't really explode until his last year of college soccer and there's so many examples of this in american uh culture of, of of guys having one or two really good years in college and their life just changes you know and then you know he's what a minute away from a big move to a to an english team i i think development at the pro level should be treated like the rest of the world and, and i think that should be club by club i don't think that should be league mandated you know if you're at uh chelsea and you want to buy players great. You go buy players. Of course, they're going to have an academy and, and they've developed so many good players, but then other clubs become selling clubs, right? Some teams want a second team. Other clubs might not want a second team. Other clubs might not think that's an expenditure worth worthwhile. Some clubs, you look at FC Dallas or Philly. Philly is a great example. They promote so many young players to the first team and they end up selling a lot of players. Other clubs, they don't. They don't do that. They don't play any academy kids in the first team. But they have a second team, and I think people are still wondering, like, what's the purpose of that second team, right? And, and, and the pathway can get blocked. And I think college is a place where your pathway can't get blocked, you know, where it's a place where I think there, there's still enough players to go around. We don't all have to fight over the same players. And I think, you know, look at all the players who've come through the Super Draft, even in the last four or five years, who've been sold to European clubs. And essentially, those are free 
free transfer fees for those MLS clubs, you know, and the colleges at the end of the day, they don't, they don't better benefit financially from that. And so, you know, I wish it was used more and it has, I think the smart MLS clubs do use the draft well, but it's, um, I wish it was used more like NBA and NFL where, you know, we could be a farm system. We could reduce players for them for free, you know, like essentially that's what's happening. We can, we can get guys that are ready um, out of our locker room to step into another locker room. That's not just on the talent side. I think, you know, one of the things of any successful team needs is you, you need high character. You need reliability. If you take a top player who's played at a top program for three or four years, you know what you're going to get every day. And I think that's why a lot of those guys can still find their way on an MLS roster and fill find success is they can fill a role player. We might not, you know, be developing the best nines and, and wingers and sevens for, you know, the MLS DP level, right? Like they, I'm realistic about that part. But I do think a lot of guys who come through the system of college can still go into a locker room and help drive winning in an organization, can help drive consistency, can help... Uh, can, can, can make that jump still. And so how do we marry those two ideas? I think is, is probably a big question. How can we continue to, to work, you know, and be aligned? Um, the reality is I think a lot of top college teams and MLS next pro, like they're going after the same players. Um, but again, I still think there's enough players to go around where, uh, you know, it's best for, MLS next pro if the college teams are playing really good football and, and and they're producing players it's really good for us too if our local MLS next pro teams are really competitive and we can have a relationship with them and, and then maybe some of our players can go into training with them in the summer and you know we can they can count on a really high level games in the spring so I think it's like a win-win and, 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 and the stronger you know one ecosystem is the stronger our, another ecosystem is. I don't. I don't think it's a. It's a law of diminishing returns. You know. I think uh, everyone can benefit here, and it just takes a vision for everyone to get aligned, right? And I think at the end of the day, it's all about growing the game in this country, right? It's all about continuing to to elevate the game in this country. Yeah, I think you sum it up perfectly there, and I think you know, like you mentioned there, it's all about growing the game. You know, I think it's something I strongly believe in that everybody should kind of be aligned on the all pathway. And I, I know it's extremely complicated to pull off. And it's like you mentioned, the big question, you know, obviously something I don't think we have time for to address here, even the resources. So, but I think you sum it up very well there. The last point I kind of wanted to touch on here, and this is something you mentioned long prior in the conversation, but it's becoming more and more relevant. I think throughout soccer in the U.S. and I think college soccer coaches are running into it more is that there aren't that many competitive games for a lot of top level youth players now coming through. And, you know, like you mentioned there, a lot of times there's an academy game on the weekend or something like that, but there's 30 people and little consequences if results don't go your way. I mean, I know there's the MLS next playoffs and, you know, generation Adidas cup for the MLS clubs, but how do you think we can maybe encourage that more? You know, is there something in the youth game or, you know, as players get older, can we find something to, you know, have more meaningful games for these players so they're better aligned and, you know, getting into the college environment. But also, I think it benefits development so much if you have more meaningful games. Yeah, I still think winning is important at any level, right? And um, it's not the end-all, be-all. But games where both teams are going for it, there, there, there's an emphasis on reactions, there's an emphasis on all the details, there's an emphasis on accountability. And if, if, if you don't get the job done, like your season could be over. Like it's hard, I think, uh, for us as a staff and, and probably our colleagues to to see a lot of those games. Um, you'll see them, right? Don't get me wrong. Like you'll you'll definitely see them. I remember the old days in the DA Cup, right? Like where it was the, there was four teams left and it was group stage. And on that last stage, um, you know, it'd go down the goal differential the last 15 minutes and you'd hear one field, uh, groups are going crazy and the next field they score and they're going to go through on goal differential or they're going to go through on a point. And, you know, it felt like a World Cup set up on the last day and the national championship was decided over almost a month, right? And so you would play uh, that round of four and then you would take like a week off and then you would play the quarterfinals and then you would all go to the next location, you know, a week later and play semifinals, finals, like, I love that format, like, and I, I thought it was brilliant. And I know there's probably a lot of reasons they can't continue to do that. Um, I think we find good models and then we want to change them and tweak them rather than, you know, leaving them alone and like let them grow and 
We're always constantly changing everything in our country. You soccer, there's always a new, I can't even like, I do this professionally full time. And half the times, you know, my staff will come and say, there's this event and I've never heard of it. Like I, I couldn't even tell you the acronym. It's some number and elite and E and I, I don't, it's so complex, right? Like there's so many different teams and so many different national championships that um, it gets watered down a little bit, right? Um, but I still think there's so many pockets of our country where we have a lot of like untapped talent. And for us as a soccer country, like the DA and, and ML has been great because it's 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 kind of taken away this uh, pay for play model, right? And that's the way the rest of the world works. But we need to get more into urban areas. You know, you know, we need to get, uh, we need to really diversify our sports still, um, it's such a big country that it's hard to have like a one size fits all model. Um, but there are, there is talent in Alaska, you know, there, there is, there is talent in Hawaii. There is, there is talent everywhere and it just needs to be nurtured and developed. And I think that's really like the, the big challenging part of development in our country, but also the exciting part. And, um, it's hard to keep track of it all, if I'm being honest, right? Like it's 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 hard hard to keep track of youth soccer now. You know, back when I was playing, I was like the old guy, but it was like there was the McGuire Cup, right? Like you won your state cup, that was a big deal. Then you went to regionals, then you played in the national championship. And it was like that is the undisputed champion of U19. And now it's different. You know, you see MLS clubs, they don't even bring their top, they don't even bring their top talent to like, you know, the the MLS next playoffs, right? You're like, well, this guy is playing in MLS next pro or he's on the bench there. And, you know, it's just, it's just interesting, right? Like, and, and they have their way of doing it and they're evaluating how many players they send to the first team. Um, and again, soccer in our country has gotten so much better. It's developing. Uh, there's still so much more right than wrong, but I would still like to see the games mean more, right? I would still love to see uh, us cast a, a wider net and be more inclusive and bring more people into the ecosystem, right? Rather than just have the best 16, 18 players in Portland with the Timbers and then everyone else is is left off on the island to figure out, hey, how do I how do I figure this out? Right. And um that part is that part is complex. It's there's no simple solution. But I think again, if we can get in alignment and and we can still make decisions, hey, best what's best for the kid. A lot of times, like what's best for the kid is not best for me. And I have to realize that like it might be best for the kid to, to, to leave or it might be best for the kid actually to sign that contract and not show up or, you know, it might be best for the kid to, you know, actually stop playing soccer when they're done graduating because they're going to go to medical school and, and now their soccer career is done and, and that's OK and that's what they want. And so there's all these different there's all these different kind of conflicting interests. And I think that's what you see in youth soccer is everyone has their turf and everyone's trying to protect that. And sometimes, again, back to why we're all doing, we're all doing this for the players, right? Like you take the players away, every coach goes away, every administrator goes away, every executive goes away. Like it's all about what's best for the player. And if we can, you know, bring as many people into that system as possible, um, man, the, the game has unlimited potential. And I love those stories of, of guys who've gotten into the system late and then they're, they're, their level has just exploded. Um, MLS clubs are doing an incredible job scouting. I think they're going to all corners of the globe and, 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 and or the country and finding players and, and nooks and crannies and, and their system continues to get better. I think it's a real positive step that we're adding a U 18s team next year, because I thought this year, uh, that is a big, that is a big miss. Like you could literally play on three youth teams in your sophomore, junior and senior year in high school, right? Like you could not be an MLS club. Then you go to MLS club for U 17 year then they don't keep you because there's no U18 team. Then you got to go to maybe another MLS next club that has U19 or back to your local club. And so it'd be really normal to play on to play on three different teams and three different systems in your most important formative years of your sophomore, junior, and senior year. Like nowhere else in the world would that be a good model, right? And so I think that made sense to do that. Um, and they would say, well, some kids are being kept around to play MLS next pro, but how many of those guys without a U19 team are, are playing MLS Next Pro? Maybe two or three, four or five guys from each club. Not many. Again, you know, we're not drawing a big circle to bring people in. Um, and there's just, again, so much potential in, in, in this country. And we have the numbers game alone, right? Like I mean, people live in this country. Look at my young, my kids are now in the soccer system. 
like how many young kids are playing soccer and and and, and I don't even know where to sign up my kids like what what's the best model for a five-year-old or a six-year-old and I don't even know where to like put them right because there's so many different opportunities and so many different conflicting interests and so many different acronyms that you know your head starts spinning yeah no so many fantastic points there and you know, I want to do, t I want to touch on this regional league aspect. And I think it's, it isn't a problem in the US and there is a million different leagues and it's drawing players in all this, so many different directions. And, you know, I think when you look throughout the world, you know, I can say off the top of my head, you know, Spain, for example, they do have, you know, a million teams, you know, football is everything there, but, you know, they have these regional leagues where it's promotion relegation and, you know, everybody kind of plays throughout those leagues and then you know if you're in the top division of your certain region you progress on the nationals and everything like that you said there and you know you mentioned state cup i think that's a good example to go back to but you know where i'm getting with this is do you think that could be a realistic format of maybe we have you know regional leagues throughout every place in the country where there's a promotion relegation system and you know if you're at the top you win your league at the top level you go on the nationals and they compete against all the other regional league winners and you know that way it's called all under the same system and it makes probably easier for both the players and the coaches involved. Yeah, I mean, I spent some time in Spain and like they would talk about if they have to take, I was in Valencia, if they have to take like a four hour bus to Madrid, it's like, that's a long trip, <laughs> you know? And it's like, how many, just at any level of our country, like, I don't care if it's MLS or, or U12, how many times you go into a game where you're spending, you know, three to six hours just getting yourself to that match? Right. And so I think that's one of the big challenges in our country of being so big. Um, but then also, like when I was in Valencia, you know, they wouldn't recruit players from Madrid because they're like, oh, this is a different this is a different climate. This is a different culture. Like those guys, <laughs> they might not do that well here. And it's in, in American terms, it's pretty close. Right. Madrid to, to Valencia. And so I think the more you can regionalize it, the better. If we're going back to college soccer, like I know there's this now push of, of these super leagues, right? And, and that's all football driven, American football driven and basketball, the revenue sports. The reality is, is every college soccer program loses money, right? Like that, that's just the reality of the situation. We're a non-revenue sport. Doesn't mean we're not as valuable, but I think we need to be more strategic in terms of how much money we're spending in travel, right? And so now with, you know, West Coast teams being the ACC and the Big Ten goes to, to both coasts, they're going to try that for four or five years. And I think they're going to say, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and I look at the hockey model in college hockey, and that makes a lot more sense. And I think that's what we need to get to in college soccer, right? Like a regional division. Like if we had a Pacific Northwest, West Coast division, NorCal, we would have an incredible 13, 14 teams, right? And you would reduce travel time. Uh, you would reduce costs. You have natural rivalries. I mean, you look now just in our state in football, like Oregon and Oregon State aren't going to play each other in football. That doesn't make any that doesn't make any sense. You know, so like Oregon tennis now is going to go play Rutgers. There's no natural rivalries, you know, like and 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 you need those natural rivalries. I think that's like a big part of of college athletics, you know, like how are Washington and, and Oregon State not on the same men's soccer conference? You know, like that doesn't make any sense, right? We can only bust to three teams here in the Northwest. We can bust to Washington, Seattle, and Oregon State. You know, we need to bring more teams into this area. Um, I think have like, hey, who's the best three teams in the region? Have a single table. And then those teams maybe go on and play teams from the other region. I still like the tournament. I think it's like you should have a tournament. Uh, I like conference tournaments. Those those are good ideas. The as many trophies as you can play for, the better. But I think now with you know in college soccer specifically with like RPI and all these metrics, like teams are so strategic about who they schedule that you're not getting a lot of like natural regional rivalries anymore. That that you that you used to get. I think that you you should have. You know, like Oregon and I, even though we're in this Oregon State. And in Portland, we're in the same league now. They're, they've moved to the West Coast Conference, which is great. We're, we're really happy to have them. But like, we're going to create an Oregon Cup next year, right? So like, hey, whoever wins that gets a cup too. Uh, we did that. We did that with Seattle U, like a coffee cup, uh, a couple of years ago. And so again, it's just like these natural rivalries. And I think that's soccer in the Northwest. Like, I mean, you look at the Timbers and the Sounders; like they're battling, they're competing, and the Whitecaps. Like that's what you need in sports. You you need to have derby matches um i even look in the acc sometimes and you'll have teams that are 
you know, 15 minutes from each other, not play each other in a regular season. And you're just like, man, is this, is this model working? You know, like, is this model that I don't think it's sustainable, right? In college athletics for, for Olympic sports, I don't think it's sustainable. And I think we have to get back to a place. And I think we will. I think when everyone kind of goes through this first cycle of five years, like, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, for Cal to be traveling to the East coast to play all these games, just because their football team needs that revenue, um, that TV revenue. And, and, and I think even for student athlete experience, which is what we're talking about, like, I know when we travel East coast, it's great. We do it every so often, but you, you're exhausted. You know, like you, you've just spent six hours on a flight. Uh, you're missing some class. Uh, the reality is we're not flying charter. It's different. Like I think Chip Kelly said it best is like for football, that's yeah, different because you're flying charter, you know, but like how many soccer teams are flying charter, right? Like how many men's soccer teams are flying charter where they can leave right after the game. So I think at all levels, like the more regional you are and look at MLS now, you don't like, we used to have East coast teams come to Portland and play regular season games. And now with, with the, the amount of teams we have in MLS, that's not happening. So at, at, at every level, I think the less travel you have and the, and the more time you have for, for playing and, and review and studying the better. Yeah. I think fantastic point there. And I think you do a great job of summarizing not not only at the youth level, which I think is where that conversation began, but also the college level. And I think you bring up a fantastic point there that I didn't even really acknowledge is how much travel that takes place at that. And even, you know, the professional level, I know that's a different argument at a different degree, but I think, you know, you bring up fantastic points in saying all that. And again, I want to thank you so much for coming on and, you know, talking about your journey, your program, and then also talking about changes throughout the game, you know, I think I got so much insight into your perspective there about, you know, changes throughout the game here in the U S and I think I can take so much away from that. And also in just hearing about your program and obviously you guys have become one of the premier programs nationally in the re most recent years. And I think that's a huge credit to you and what you guys have going there. So really appreciate you coming on again. Well, thanks for having us. I appreciate all this work you're doing in, in, in your space. It's awesome. I, I learned a lot just following, following you guys, who's going where, who's doing that. Uh, it's it's good to have more people invest in the college game and in the game in our country. So thanks for all the work you're doing. And I can tell you love the game and the sport and you're doing it for all the right reasons. So so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much again. And I have other people helping me that I really appreciate. And Are you yeah. guys done with your spring or do you have any more games? We actually play later today. I have a game in four hours. Yes, yeah, so that'll oh. be a game of the season. Who are you guys playing? We play University of Rhode Island tonight. So it's oh, an interstate derby match for us too. So Great. Yeah, that'll be great. Those Derby games. We have Washington on the weekend. And uh, you know, that that still gives game that still gives the spring meaning. So wish you the best with, with finals and as you wrap up uh the spring season as you go into the summer, uh keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll be in touch then. Thank you. Take it easy. See you. Bye.